Okay, um, so welcome back. Um, we, a um, couple orders of business. Um, so we've, we've lost, our studio paid for our, for our sort of meetup.com cost for the last year. And so that's up now. So if anybody works for a company that's interested in, in, in um, sponsoring and having their little label on the our meetup page, and, um, it's just, I think it's 200 bucks or something for the year, meetup.com fees. Get in touch with me if do you uh, I do. I do know about it. Um, oh yeah, I'll get in touch. And so yeah, I Joe might be okay. Okay. okay, sweet. Um, and then uh, so one one thing that I wanted to briefly talk about is PDX data. So there's a few. The the thing to remember is PDXdata.org, and um, uh, there's a few of us meetup groups that are sort of in the data science -y space. So there are our meetup group, this one, uh, which other ones are in it? Python, data science, data science data group, users, data users. Yeah, so it's just sort of a, it's sort of a, a sort of a early on sort of umbrella meetup group, not meetup group itself, but the group is trying to organize sort of common resources that can be used sort of across across the different Different meetup groups. Um, and there's, there's a um, there's a Slack room for this, so it's just pdxdata.slack.com if you want to invite yourself. Um, there's some some interesting discussions going on there. Um, so the next meetup we're going to have is uh, 5 April. Uh, Winston, our own Winston, who's here, is going to talk about some uh, NLP NLP work that he's doing. And then on uh, the 9th of May, we're going to have Andrew Bray from Reed College talking about um, collaborative coding with GitHub and uh, RStudio server. Um, and I'm probably going to send out, we have sort of this meetup and two more planned, but I'll probably send out a call for proposal soon. Um, somebody I think is here tonight with a proposal that I'll talk to, and then it'd be great to have more coming in though to keep, uh, keep the momentum going. Um, tonight is our first um, experimental run uh, for recording. So, uh, we're going to try and record the talks. It's not going to be streaming or anything, and we'll try that next time. But we'll put it up on YouTube or Vimeo after. Um, let's see. Oh, and after the, the meetup, if anybody wants to go to a local bar, we're going to do that. Um, just come come meet, it, meet at the end. Um, and so tonight we have uh, uh, Joe Rickert and, and uh, John, I forget your last name, Lamb. Uh, from uh, Microsoft slash Revolution Analytics. You guys can introduce yourselves more appropriately. Um, and they're going to talk about, uh, Joe's going to talk about R at Microsoft and, and John about um, a lap around R tools for Visual Studio. So, um, Joe, do you need a few minutes? Okay. Cool. So, how do you guys in this room? Studio. Wow, that's a lot, right? Compared to like, we have a CL, I was talking to the CLR user group like a couple days ago, right? Like, that's awesome, thank you. Um, the, the thing that I'm going to show you today, how many of you guys, okay, like here's the crazier question, how many of you guys have actually downloaded and tried our tools for Visual Studio? One. Oh, didn't even know it existed, yeah, sure, you know, like that, that, that's, that's fine. Well, now you do, right? Um, Okay, <laughs> so you're one of those guys, right? So we have we have stats. We we, we deliver um, all the downloads through our you know content delivery network, right? So I have all these stats, right? And for our lawyers, right, tell us all these things, right? So one of the things we have to do is RTVS is downloaded in two parts, right? There's RTVS.msi or exe or whatever. Thing. It's RTVS.exe, and the second part is um, our host.msi. And for a variety of reasons, because our host is released, we actually. I think my team is the first team in Microsoft to ship GPLv2 licensed code. Our host uh, is, is that because it has to bind and link into the R process, right? Um, so we have these two things. So we actually monitor downloads so that the, the first half are the people that have just downloaded and never installed it, right? And then if, if then when the installer runs, it downloads the second half, right? From the, right, so 92%, so you're, you're part of the 8%. I finally got to meet one of you guys. Um, so our tools of Visual Studio is, um, is R put into Visual Studio. Now, um, 
How many of you guys use R Studio? I'm sure probably everybody in the room, right? Like, like you know, there's always that one zealot that's, I'm just a command line guy, and I'll just do that all the time, right? But also that guy, um, Joe, you, you might be the closest to the company. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, R Studio is a fantastic product. It's been around for a long time. I think they do a great service to, to the community. You know, I had an R Studio dev in my audience in, in Seattle, um, you know, and I, I spent a bunch of time apologizing, sorry, right? Like, it, it's just this thing where, you know, we, we don't have a choice right here. We, we have to have some tooling if we're going to be taken seriously as a full stack or, you know, vendor, right, you know, out there in the world, you know, to say, yeah, we've got tooling for you, we've got um, run times for you, we've got services for you, we've got cloud stuff, um, you know, all of those things that, that Joe talked about earlier. Um, our tools for Visual Studio is an add-on for your regular Visual Studio, right? So you need Visual Studio 2015 and above, right? Um, and this is Visual Studio 2015 just um, starting up. We have three different flavors of it. We have a community edition, which is free for personal use, and if you're a small company that we can't shake money out of, right? Like, you know, you can read the lawyerly stuff like yourself, right? But for enterprises, right, you know, the guy from Intel who just left, right, you know, we're, we're going to make them pay. Um, so. So professional and enterprise are two for pay versions of Visual Studio, but community is free. Um, certainly for your own PCs and stuff, you just want to try it out, right? You know, absolutely free to download. I am terribly embarrassed as an engineer to say that the download for the community edition, or honestly, any version of Visual Studio is gigantic and bloated, right? It's a six gigabyte download. It's bigger than the operating system I've worked on Windows. Like, you know, I was like, really, how, how is this twice the size of um, Windows? But it is. Um, so we're working on fixing that. Right. And if you guys stay tuned, our big conference next week at Build, you might hear some interesting things about, you know, um, what we are doing to fix that. Right. But for the time being, if you've got a big fat Internet connection and six gigabytes you sneeze and laugh at, you will be able to go off and, and, and grab, you know, um, um, Visual Studio and try it out yourself. Um, so anyway, so with that, that kind of like kind of set out, like here, let me just kind of take you on a quick um, little tour of the project. So everything integrates in. I happen to like black. I just find it more soothing than the bright white screen. Um, but of course, we have themes and stuff. So if you prefer the white background, that, that works as well. Um, and uh, so conceptually, if you think about how this thing works, right, we have Visual Studio that runs in one process, and we have R that runs in a separate process, right? And that R host thing that I told you about earlier, that GPL thing that, we, that my team shipped, um, that thing is the thing that bolts onto your R interpreter that you're using on your machine, and we use an interprocess communications protocol to speak between Visual Studio in one process and R host running in a separate process. You know, it's to foreshadow some interesting things that we are absolutely thinking about, um, especially along this kind of like remote R server execution environment thing that lots of people love to have, right? There is absolutely nothing outside of scary security problems, right, that prevent us from taking that R host thing and running it on another machine, right? There's just dev work and security, a bunch of other things, right? But, but you know, those, that's absolutely coming in the roadmap and, and things that we are going to be doing um, in the future, which will allow you to have that remote execution context um, as well. Um, let me see. There was some other thing. Oh, yeah. So we are open source under MIT. Right, so if you want to grab the source code for um, RTVS itself, right, you can just go to github.com slash Microsoft slash RTVS, right, and you can go get the code under an MIT license. Um, and if, I said the R hosting is under GPL because we have to. Um, let me see. And of course, it's free, right? So that's kind of the last um, little spiel about that. Um, so because it's Visual Studio, we have all of the really kind of cool like docking things that just come for free out of us being in Visual Studio and the hundreds of person years worth of engineering effort that has gone to building the shell that we have here. Right? So I can take like the R interactive window that, 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 that shows up, right? And I can dock it and I can snap it off and all the kinds of things that um, you would expect if you've used um, Visual Studio in the past. And the key thing is this is just R, right? This is whatever R that you happen to have installed. You know, as my team was building this thing, you know, we were, we thought, well, you know, we works on my machine is a classic engineer refrain, right? And uh, one of the things was like, hey, you know, like who would ever have multiple versions of R in their machine, right? It turns out lots of people. Um, certainly the people that work in Revolution certainly have lots of versions of R, right? So um, we, we then realized when things weren't working, spent a lot of time testing it, we can validate that it works on essentially every version of R 3.3 and above, right? There's various weird breaking, changey things against R, 
our host thing, right, that, that will break us with earlier versions. We just haven't done the engineering work to go back into the past, right? But any version of R33 or better, right, um, we, we support um, in the product as well. So certainly work with CranR, right? This happens to be um, Microsoft R Open that's running, you know, in, in this case, right, as well as the R server product, right? Um, any version of R should work um, using uh, with, uh, with RTVS, given those, like the, the small set of caveats. Um, so a couple of the interesting things here, like a lot of the things that you just expect would work, right? So if I wanted to type some code over here, right, like let's say I wanted to define an add function, right? And uh, just say X plus Y, and I can go and select all of the code here. And I can hit Control Enter, right? That's going to go send it to the REPL, right? And it's going to execute. I now have this function over here. If I wanted to write some more code and hit Control Enter on that to execute it, right? You know, the same kinds of things that you would expect, you know, totally work inside of RTVS. Um, this kind of style of programming, like, so here's one of the first kinds of questions I like to ask the audience in, in this talk really is, to me, there's kind of like, like two styles of this interactive programming, right? One style is I spend all day long over here, right? And I type all sorts of stuff over here, right? Um, or, and, and then I just execute stuff. And then the good stuff, I'm going to scroll back through my history and copy and paste the good stuff, right? And paste it back into an editor. Or do you spend all this typing the stuff that you would otherwise type into the REPL over in the editor first and then select and control enter it and move it over to the other side? How many people type things into the editor and then control enter it into the REPL first? So kind of like half. And for the other half, do you spend all your time typing stuff into the REPL instead? Yeah? Raise your hand, please. I'm trying to get a vote here. Because right? it, it's OK. Like, this is not a judgment call, right? The reason why I'm asking you this question, all honestly, is like I need to figure out how to prioritize my tiny team's resources, right? Like, you know, we you know, like a Microsoft giant company, right? Hundred thousand employees, right? But I've got three full-time devs working on um, on RTVS and two guys on loan right now, right? So, so that's it, right? That's the whole team, right? So I got to prioritize my resources there to try and figure out where should I invest them, right? So over in the Seattle R user group, which was a slightly different distribution than I saw here. Um, it was overwhelmingly, like, I type stuff into the editor first and just shoot things over the rep. Like, so, so this gives me an idea whether or not I should prioritize features like, one feature we want to add, for example, is kind of incremental search through your history, right, in the REPL, right? So if I was looking for, you know, somewhere where I type two Ds, right, I could type DD and then hit up arrow, and it would do a search back through all of my history, right, and just show me the lines where DD showed up somewhere, right? So things like that, right? That's on our backlog of things, but I just need to prioritize it against, you know, uh, one guy at the Seattle R user group meeting had this great suggestion, right? He happens to be one of the, I don't know, the only people perhaps that use R on Eclipse, right? So he uses the R Eclipse plugin, right? So, so this guy was just, oh, I love this feature. He's this Russian guy, right? I can't do Russian very well, even though I work with three Russians. Um, yeah. But... <laughs> But, but that guy, right, he was going, yeah, you know, like control R, control V, right, and Eclipse is the best thing ever. And what that does is it takes your selection that you just executed, sends it to the REPL, runs it in the REPL, but then copies all of the output that was generated in the REPL back into the editor and places it below your insertion point, right, and inserts it into your buffer, right? So what it does at the end is it takes all the output of all this stuff. That your code ran and generated some output to standard out. It takes all of that and pastes it back into your, um, your editor window underneath. Yes, yes. And uh, for some people, they love that working style. Right? Just, oh, this is the best thing ever, right? And so... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, like there's, there's things like this, right? You know, um, you know, so again, like when I try and figure out how do I prioritize these two features, right? That's why I, I, you'll hear me asking other questions kind of like that, right, throughout this um, thing, right? But love to hear about people's working styles, right? Because that's really important to me. So I said, I'm not a data scientist, right? You know, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer. I write ones and zeros of these things. Um, and uh, would love to understand more about how you do your kind of day-to-day -day work so I can figure out how to prioritize, you know, the work uh, items for my team. Sure. 
Mm-hmm. Sure. Like, and I don't want to make any judgment calls about how people, like, do their work, right? Like, I want to try and support as many styles as I can, right? But, of course, there's a budget to this, right? And, you know, so I got to prioritize features based on who would like them the most or the largest group. And, and then eventually, over time, with infinite resources, we'll get to all the other ones um, as well. So um, so here's a couple things, you know, some, some kind of, like, fairly obvious things that you would expect, right? We have integrated help, right? So if you had... You know, question mark, like, you know, like read CSV, right? So you can see, like, can I have my kindergarten level skills. This thing can either show up in a separate browser window, or we can also put the help inside of the, um, the, the Visual Studio as well. And there's a command line, there's a, there's a project settings. We have an R tools menu here where you can see all of the different options that we have available in the product. And for example, this one here, we can flip this from external to automatic, and you can have it show, help show up in a tool window. I find that's not very useful as a feature, right? Because I like alt tab, right? So I tend to leave it on external, right? So that I can have my help show up in a big giant window that I can just alt tab back and forth between that and, um, and, and the product itself. We've done things like um, integrate plotting right into the product as well, right? So if I do something simple like pairs, empty cars, right? You can see that that shows up here. One of the things you'll notice here is like you'll see this window is small, right? You know, I just kind of tore it off. I can double click to make it bigger, but when I do that, we force a re-render, right, at that point in time as well, right? So we will always render the plot using all of the available pixels that, you know, are on the screen um, where appropriate. And, you know, the things that you would expect, you know, on these little toolbar I um, icons up there, I can copy and paste plots out of this thing and, you know, paste it off the clipboard into other things, or I can export it as a PDF or, you know, as a, as a PNG file or other things, right? So we have, you know, the kind of integrated support. We also have a history thing. So if you did multiple plots, right, there's forward and back arrows and you navigate back and forth through the history. A feature we are planning to add is one where we can tear off the plots in the history as well, right? So again, this is kind of like a vote thing. How, you know, how cool would this be? But of course you have to compare it with somebody else, something else. But um, one thing we're gonna allow you to do is tear off plot windows. Right, so whereas these things will be interactive and run against the commands in the history, once you tear off, it becomes read-only, right? And when you tear it off, so now you can kind of have like a bunch of plot windows, you can tear them off, look at them side by side, and things like that, right? Things that otherwise, certainly in other products like our studio, right, you're kind of going forward and back with the arrow, trying to say, ah, you know, are these things different or, or save them or do some other thing, right? So, um, so this plot, this kind of tear off thing is something we're thinking of um, doing as well. Um, let's see, so let's uh, put that back where I found it. Um, so if you look up here, like let's assign, let's create another global variable. So let's put empty cars into um, a global variable. And we have our, our variable explorer here as well. The kind of cool thing about our variable explorer that's somewhat different than um, our studios is that we can drill into this thing arbitrarily deep, right? So we don't, we're not just going one level down, we can go as far down the rabbit hole as you want. Um, <clears throat> we have this little hourglass thing, which of course, right, you know, does what you would expect. It will bring this thing up as a table viewer, right? And this table viewer um, works well. We spend a lot of time, we're actually rather proud of the performance of this thing, right? Super fast. It virtualizes. Even though, you remember, we have this multi-process architecture for how this thing works, right? So all the data actually lives inside of the R process. But we're pretty smart about fetching only the data that we need in order to render the view that's currently on there. So you'll find that we're quite performant for really large data sets of hundreds of thousands or million rows um, as well, right? Because we're just moving the data that we're, that's required to um, render the view back and forth, right, across that inner process um, um, boundary. Huh. Other things, let's see, let's see, let's see. Well, let's, let's open up a file so you're not watching me um, just code stuff. Let's kind of look at this thing here. Now, let's close that window there. So one of the other things that we have support in here, as you can see that on the left-hand side, this is an R markdown file, right? And uh, so we, we have this, the same kind of integrated support that you would expect, right? Um, so for example, if I wanted to go read a file, right, I can control enter on that line, right, and then go execute that code in there. So, um, so those are the kinds of things that you would expect to work. Um, and you can also go right-click on the file and say preview HTML. Right, and this will go off and do all the knitter fun stuff, right? As you see, it's going to go off and think. And then at the end, it's going to pop up on the generative file using the default browser as well, right? So, so this thing, you know, again, like, we're a tool, right? We don't really do anything here, right? We're claiming a lot of credit for stuff that, you know, Hadley and Joe and those guys over in our studio have worked really hard on, right? But not surprisingly, it just works, right? So, um, so this stuff works as long as you have Pandoc installed on your machine, right? 
Um, so, you know, this is just like an interactive. This is using the DT leaflet library, right? So you can do these fun kind of like incremental searchy things right across um, uh, the data frame. Um, and this is leaflet over here, right? So these are airports in the United States. And so great way of visualizing bugs in the output, right? So, you know, like this one called delete and things and stuff like that. So, um, but it's kind of cool, right? Like all this stuff just kind of works. Now, one thing that, again, we're trying to think of like, how do we make this even more useful, right? So, so um, one of the things we would really love to be able to do is imagine that you had this thing and you did this preview thing, but instead you had like a publish button, right? And the publish button would allow you to then take that same R Markdown document and then publish it to a, a server, right? Like certainly our studio supports this for our pubs, but what if you could go off and just provision your own, you know, Azure like, or, you know, publishing server thingy, right? You know, that will just spin up an Azure website. You don't have to do anything outside of, well, you know, at some point paying for it, right? Um, but that will give you this, this option to just go push this thing up there. And we can do the same kinds of things, right? You've seen the shiny.io server um, stuff that the, the RStudio guys have done, right? You know, I think that's just a super useful thing to go off and build. Um, some of the more interesting challenges, I think, and we discovered this with a bunch of work. My team also owns, how many of you guys use Python here? Lots of you. How many of you have ever used Python tools for Visual Studio, which is my, my team's other product? Nobody. Okay. So, um, random advertisement for PTVS. It's also free. It's also open source. But the cool thing about PTVS is that if you ever need to do mixed mode development, in other words, you're building a native Python module. Right, and you're writing it in C or whatever native language is your favorite language, right? but generally C. Um, you can debug using PTVS from your Python code. You can step into your C code, debug your C code, and step back out into your Python code. Isn't that cool? Right? This is like by far the, the, this has gotten people to convert from being Mac users back to Windows users, right? That one feature alone, <laughs> right? So, right, because like we're, we're, we don't do a lot, right? We use the Visual Studio native debugger, which is a fantastic debugger. You know, like, you know, hundreds of person years worth of engineering effort went into that thing and that comes along for free. Right? We just had to do the right little bits and pieces of glue to kind of glue those things together, right? So, so we've got this fantastic debugging experience. By the way, mixed mode debugging is also going to come to um, our tools um, for Visual Studio as well, right? So I'm just about to hire a guy just to go off and do that. Um, that works. So, um, so that, that's going to be cool. So do any of you guys build native R modules? Okay. So what? A different crowd, right, that I will talk to. I we'll have like the one or two guys who are, yeah, this is awesome, right? You know, but, um, but hopefully we'll get um, that, that stuff out to you as well. Yeah. Cool. So let me see. So I showed you that stuff. I showed you that stuff. The debug. Oh, yes, the debugger. Thank you. Right. So let me, uh, let me just go off and create another file. I'll just show you a simple, you know, little um, example of that. Um, so again, let's imagine I have two, like a bunch of functions, right? So a function, this is kind of like my, my standard demo um, for this thing. And let's actually make this do something, right? So let's have it um, print X, right? And then let's have it actually mutate X here. Um, and then let's have it return X. Let's create another function, F2. And of course, if we just want to make this bigger so you can see it, we can do that too, um, x, so let's call f1 passing x, and down here, let's call f2 passing 42. Now, so inside of our debugger, as you might expect, I can go off and set a breakpoint. Let's just start off with a breakpoint here, okay? Um, we have this kind of slightly awkward thing that I'm not happy with, but we're, we're, we'll fix this. But for now, you have to first attach your debugger, right? And then, as you'll see, when I attach a bugger, the window layout kind of changes in Visual Studio. And that's primarily because Visual Studio kind of has these two modes, right? There's the I'm editing code mode in Visual Studio, and then there's the I'm debugging mode, right? So this puts it into the I'm debugging mode. And then, of course, the second thing we have to do is go off and source the file, right? You know, so what, what file would I like you to go off and run, right? Um, so I, I just never use this except for demos, but, you know, like right here, this is the source R script thing, right? So I can click on that. And that goes off and sources this file, and you can see here the little um, uh, yellow arrow says, I'm currently stopped at this line. Um, if you go over here and you look at locals, um, by the way, we're going to make variable explorer in a future release do everything that local says. Right now, variable explorer is limited because it only looks at um, global scope right now um, inside of R. But in a future release, what we will also have is we'll have it allow you to look inside function level scope, right? So it's going to effectively be the locals variable um, for you while you're debugging code. And it's also going to allow you to look at other scopes, like the scope to packages 
create and stuff, right? You know, so you can look at the scopes um, um, inside of your packages as well. Now, so as uh, I kind of step in here, so F11, right? Standard debugging things, it, it steps in, right? And as you can see, let me go back to locals here so that you can see this a little bit better. You'll see the value of X um, changing and displaying in there. If I hit F11 again, what's kind of cool is you can see here, X is still this, right? But you're seeing this, um, this deferred execution thing, right? Inside of um, R, right? Um, or promises. Um, so you don't see that value evaluated until now, right? The value is actually evaluated. So you see it's 43, or right? you do the print, you can return, you can hit F5 to continue running. All the kinds of things that you would expect to have inside of a debugger. Um, the one feature that's kind of missing that we really love in the Visual Studio debugger um, that we don't currently have in there is kind of shift F11, which is stepped out of the current function that I'm in. Right, because usually you use shift F11 a lot because you kind of accidentally stepped into a function that you didn't want to step into, and you go, oh, I don't want you, know, and that'll just take you out of that scope. Turns out R has really weird semantics, and um, and we were having a really hard time working, getting that to work reliably, so we, we ripped it out, um, but we really want to put it back in um, as soon as possible. Um, so I showed you debugger. Uh, other things, so you plot, help, debugger. Um, as you can imagine, you know, shiny apps will just work, right, because we really have to do nothing but allow you to call a function, right, you know, to run your shiny app and, and to edit that stuff. Um, so, yeah, I can certainly show you that, right, but, but you know, shiny apps, can be built and developed inside of that. What we really want to do is have a better experience for that, right? So again, some of the things that our studio does is very clever for Shiny. As you all know, right, if you're, how many people build Shiny stuff here, right? So at least a few people, yeah. Like Shiny's really cool. Like I think it's, it's a really interesting technology. And, um, but the kind of like painful thing that you accidentally always run into, right, is that when your Shiny app is running, right, your R interpreter is currently like sitting in a, in a, in a wait loop, right, waiting for more HTTP requests to, to come from the web page, right? So when you're, when you're done, what, with RStudio, what they do very well is, you know, it pops up a Shiny app by default in a window. Right, you can open up in a browser if you want, but it pops up in a window that it controls. And when you click on X to close that window, they also terminate the loop, right? So it's one of these nice little bits of polish, right, that we will absolutely have on our backlog. We know about it, and we will, you know, go off and implement that as well. Um, other things, I'm trying to think. Oh, yes, thank you, thank you. I always forget this one. Um, and uh, so this is this data science settings menu um, that we have here. And uh, so this one here says, now, okay, I want to caution, like, if you are actually a real Visual Studio user and you've spent years customizing your, your, your Visual Studio environment just so that every keystroke is exactly what you want, make sure you save that before you change it, right? Um, you know, we even warn you, if you actually bother reading all the words on this dialog box, it says something about that, right? And um, so, so if you do, you know, if you change that, right, there's a second thing that will ask you, hey, would you like your key keyboard shortcuts to be as compatible with our studio as possible? You say yes. So things like control shift S, right, will do things like source the file and, you know, the things that you would expect, right? So, um, so we also have, you know, nice little things to make it easier for people um, um, to, um, to try it. Um, other things. So some other kind of random things that I just want to point out, right? Because again, we're built on top of Visual Studio, which is a very mature IDE, has been around forever. Visual Studio comes with a ridiculous number of extensions, right? So you'll notice over here, right, that I've got this weird thing. If you notice my line numbers as I'm going up and down, right? what on earth is that? Well, if you're like me and you love the Vim key bindings, right? You know, and I also, I'm, you know, I'm using um, VS Vim, which is a fantastic free um, plugin, which brings Vim key bindings to Visual Studio, right? Like, I want to go up three lines, right? So I can do that, right? So I can see three is that line and I can just hit K, right? If you ever use Vim yourself, I can do that. So, um, so all sorts of extensions and things just come for free, right? Simply because um, you know, it is Visual Studio. We've got various extensions that will allow you to copy and paste code out of your editor that is syntax colored, right, and we'll paste it in as HTML, right, into whatever it is that you want to paste it into. Right, so lots of little things like that that, again, right, it's just produced by the community, lots of stuff that, that's out there, right, that you can use because, you know, it's just this giant idea that has lots of people, millions of users that, that go off and build extensions for it. And that has a very rich extensibility model. And in fact, RTVS is built on top of the very same um, extensibility model as the guy who built the line number cool thing on the left-hand side or VSVim uses um, for their thing as well. Right, so lots, lots of neat things there as well. So questions, I'd love to open up the questions. Yes. Uh, 
Version? Version control, yes. So lots and lots and lots of support for that. Um, so there is, so the GitHub guys have a GitHub extension, right, for, um, I don't have it installed right now, but absolutely. So if you want to go off and do your commits, right, and your, your merges and your branch changing and all that stuff, right, all of that support is inside of Visual Studio. And the cool thing about the community edition is we made it so that all extensions, once upon a time, right, back in the dark ages of Microsoft, right, we um, were, were very protective of, you know, like extensions, right? So we would refuse to allow extensions to load onto, load onto the free ones, right? But now all extensions are load onto the free versions of Visual Studio, right? So we removed that restriction. So absolutely. Oh, sorry. Well, that's not our, that's not, our, that's not for us to say, right? Like, you know, like, ultimately it's up to customers, right? Like, our studio is cross-platform, we're not, right? So, you know, so we run on Windows, and Windows, and Windows. Why? Well, because this giant, like, multi-hundred thousand person year engineering effort for Visual Studio is built on top of Windows, and uses technologies that, frankly, only Windows has, right? Um, but, and here's the but, um, there is another thing that Microsoft has that you may or may not know about, but if you look at it, it's called VS Code. Any people ever heard of VS Code? I'm sure, like, well, my, my, my Microsoft loyalists in the back row, I'm sure, have all um, heard of it, right? But for everybody else, um, this is Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is a cross-platform, IDE is a stretch, right? Like, it's basically an editor with some other extensions, right? It's kind of like Sublime, but with more stuff and with cooler technology, right, in the editor um, is probably the best way of kind of describing it. It's kind of like the, it's built on top of the same, any of you guys use the Atom editor that the GitHub guys built, right? So there's a few Atom users here as well, built on top of Electron, right? So this thing is built on top of Electron, which was, you know, released by um, the Atom guys. We use our own text editor stuff that, you guys know who Eric Gamma is? Anyone know? Like, hey. Kind of old, so, oh, there's, there's, a, there's a computer scientist in the back, right? He's one of the gang of four guys who wrote the very influential design patterns book. He's a distinguished engineer that works for Microsoft in Switzerland, and he was behind the team that went off and built um, the, uh, um, the very high performance editor um, that we have inside of VS Code. Now, why am I showing you guys this thing? It's because if there's enough customer demand, right, and I can go back to my pointy haired bosses, right, and say, please fund us, right, because this is a big engineering effort. Um, we absolutely want to go and bring um, uh, RTVS and PTVS, right, to Visual Studio Code so we have a true cross-platform um, solution. It's not, we're not that far, like, you know, we, you know, like, like, we believe 30% of the code will move over as is, and we're doing a bunch of, like, engineering effort around things like our static analysis engine that we have inside of Python and that we will write for RTVS eventually um, um, over to um, work out of process, which kind of architecturally gets us very close to um, working inside of this thing, right? So this is just like, you know, like calories and dollars and cents and, you know, that kind of um, computation. But we absolutely want to bring that there. Sorry, the... No, because this is, this thing is, I have no idea how big this is. This is not very big, right? Yeah, this is, like, Atom itself is like a 80, 90 megabyte download, if I'm not mistaken. Like, Electron is like a 50 meg, I think was, because Electron is just the Chrome web browser, right? And Node.js and some other stuff all kind of scrunched into a package. Um, and uh, so we will be in the same kind of ballpark for that. Now, all is not lost, as I said, in a week, you might hear some interesting news, right, about how we've improved that 6 gigabyte thing, right, um, as well. Yes.